Yeah, thank you, Blair. Well, in the next 15 minutes, I'm supposed to uh, di discuss and describe to you migration trends in 11 Russia's uh, time zones, and I'll try to do it as uh, well quickly as possible. Uh, well, uh, people of uh, my generation or older generations, uh, of course, uh, remember Russia and the Soviet Union in a very different light from what it is now. And uh, at that time, talking about migration or immigration to Russia uh, would sound very strange. It was a highly uh, isolated, closed society. And say in my uh, youth, uh, if you talked about immigrants to the Soviet Union, who could be mentioned? Well, some political uh, leftists, activists, some idealists, uh, or uh, some exotic groups, uh, and say in my memory of my old childhood, these were children of uh, Spanish Revolution and their descendants, one of such familiar uh, groups that uh, we really interacted with in Moscow and in other cities. But overall, it was uh, something exotic. Uh, well, the situation started to change drastically uh, although there was a number of controversies involved that still uh, well, uh, remain in, in force. Well, uh, Russia uh, always was a multi-ethnic state from the very beginning, while Slavs intermingled, first of all, among themselves and with the neighboring Finno-Ugoric groups. But uh, Russia really becomes a multi-ethnic empire approximately 450 years ago when Russian troops crossed the Volga River and uh, uh, subjugate uh, the Tatar uh, well, uh, Tsardoms uh, in that area. And after that, for the next 450 roughly years, uh, Russian state was spreading to non-Russian, non-Christian uh, usually areas, subjugating them and imposing one uh, single, well, political, cultural, linguistic and religious model. And in this sense, Russia, while it is not perceived this way very frequently because its territory is contiguous, uh, had and uh, has some similarities with other great multi-ethnic empires, well, Spain among them. At the same time, Russia has a number of parallels right now with the United States uh, because uh, after 1991, it step by step became the center of second largest migration system in the world. And it uh, might sound kind of surprising to many, but uh, it's behind only the United States, uh, surpassing, for example, immigration system that uh, was formed around Germany. Uh, well, uh, what are the characteristics of, of this system and what was really going on? Uh, I have already mentioned the first uh, unusual feature of the Russian state, and it was that while it was contiguous, it was spreading out well with uh, not only Russian political and cultural model being imposed on the others, but uh, ethnic Russians migrating to all these areas settling their changing uh, population structure. Uh, and this uh, uh, trend generally con uh, continued during the Soviet period. The Soviet uh, period also has brought the second innovation, an attempt to combine communist ideology with ideas of ethno-federalism, a creation of highly complex multi-level structure of uh, ethnic territorial units with the idea that local elites would be interested in supporting the central power and uh, would serve. In reality, very soon, uh, the, the system has uh, created new problems for itself because local elites started to expand, and there emerged competition between them and Russian speakers for the privileged positions within the system. With the decentralization and liberalization, uh, well, it became basically the major uh, destabilizing factor in the development and then in the decline of the Soviet Union. Uh, already since approximately 1975, and that means deep into the Soviet period, uh, well, ethnic Russians started to leave uh, ethnic areas of, Kazakh of uh, Kazakhstan, Central Asia, and the Transcaucasus, moving yet to Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic state. After 1991, the trend has uh, changed completely, and ethnic Russians started to move not only from all ethnic republics of the former Soviet Union, but also from many ethnic regions of Russia itself. Uh, and uh, since that time, basically, Russia acts as the major receiving country within the region. Nevertheless, uh, this is a regional system, not worldwide system, because while Russian population has increased due to migration approximately by five and a half million after 1991, only about 50,000 people came from outside the Soviet Union. 
So uh, it uh, acts uh, as a magnet, but only within this uh, post-Soviet zone. And the trends in migration that uh, Russia went through during this uh, uh, post-dissolution period uh, were drastically different. The initial stage uh, was uh, characterized by all major ethnic groups of the former Soviet Union trying to get to their titular states, Ukrainians to Ukraine, Kazakhs to Kazakhstan, Russians to Russia, Estonians to Estonia, and so on and so forth. They were afraid to become underdogs in the newly formed states, and they were afraid to lose citizenship of their titular states. Uh, sometimes they never lived in these states, but now they uh, felt more secure there. And the uh, scale of migration was expected to be very high. Predictions both in the U.S. and in Russia were that up to 25 million people would move. Uh, this figure was calculated uh, on the basis of a simple fact that 25 million Russians lived outside Russia, and overall about 54 million people in the former Soviet Union lived outside their ethnic territorial units. Uh, in reality, scale of migration was much smaller. About uh, 12 million people have moved. And for Russia, again, well, about five and a half people have immigrated. Net, net migration was about five and a half million. But nevertheless, it was much less than uh, it was expected. Why? First of all, uh, most of the states were not willing, really, to receive migrants. And even ethnic uh, connationals uh, usually were perceived as a nuisance. Second, uh, deep economic crisis also prevented movement of people. And third, with time, new socioeconomic factors started to play a more important role. Approximately till uh, 1998, uh, ethnic factors were important, and there were also large-scale refugee flows. Uh, the highest uh, level uh, refugees uh, have reached in countries like Tajikistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, where refugees comprise 10% of the overall population. In Russia, the number of refugees was the largest. It has reached 1.2 uh, million in 1994. But uh, relative to the overall population, it was relatively insignificant. Well, uh, but uh, after uh, 1998, uh, it becomes clear that political factors, uh, factors have lost their uh, importance. Well, uh, people who were politically motivated have moved those who would not move or already would, uh, would not move in the future. Uh, and uh, well, ethnic policies of most states have, mod uh, have been moderated. Uh, well, but new socioeconomic factors started to play a primary role. And migration has acquired three new features. First, it became primarily economically motivated. It became labor migration. Second, uh, it became temporary migration. And not because people did not want to move they could not move because of uh, state policies very frequently. And third, it became primarily undocumented. We talked about illegal migration before, uh, yesterday, uh, and uh, uh, when we talk about Russia, we should remember that um, term that we usually use, illegal, basically is, uh, technically is uh, not correct. Because people uh, move uh, not in order to commit crimes, while well, people uh, m uh, move to work for the most part. But as a rule, they are forced by either host or home uh, countries to violate uh, law in, in some respect because they simply uh, cannot do it legally. And the same happens in Russia. Uh, well, uh, um, citizens of most post-Soviet states, they don't even need uh, visas to uh, come to Russia, say, or to other post-Soviet states. Uh, but uh, they engage in technical violations uh, later. They either do not get work permits or uh, they declare wrong goals of visits, uh, and so on and so forth. And the same happens in this particular case. The uh, scale of such uh, labor migration uh, also is very high, and as it happens in the U.S., as it happens in many other countries, uh, media and politicians frequently exaggerate uh, uh, this scale. If you read the uh, statements by some uh, Russian officials, there are about 20 million illegals uh, in Russia and, uh, say, Moscow City, government claims that there are 10 million illegal, uh, illegals working in Moscow. The overall population of Moscow is 10 million. So, uh, nevertheless, they have found 10 million illegals uh, in Moscow right now. But this is not something unusual. Well, um, most countries of immigration 
uh, encounter such uh, situations and such claims. The problem with Russia is that very frequently uh, they come from uh, state officials. Uh, well, uh, the real uh, number of uh, labor migrants in Russia is probably uh, in peak seasons, uh, especially say in summer, uh, about four and a half million and the average figure is between three and three and a half million. It is still a very significant uh, number that uh, allows uh, to support specific uh, branches of the economy. First of all, construction, services, retail, uh, particular branches of agriculture. Uh, while uh, um, immigration, uh, labor uh, migration is also extremely important for many post-Soviet states. There exists a tremendous gap in levels of uh, per capita income, GDP per capita among the post-Soviet countries. It is, uh, for example, about uh, 1 to 18 uh, between, uh, uh, so 18 times gap between Tajikistan, the poorest post-Soviet state, and Russia. It is a much wider gap than the gap between the United States and Mexico. And uh, we you know we talked yesterday about uh, migration inflow to the United States from Mexico and from Latin America resulting from such a gap. That means that you cannot stop uh, while migration uh, by conventional uh, means uh, if you want to do it wi without uh, the introduction of very brutal uh, dictatorial policies. Uh, on the other hand, uh, migration not, is not only uh, well supportive of, say, uh, Russian economy. And here I have to say that at present, uh, the unemployment level in uh, Russia is 8.2 percent. This is the official level. It is a little bit lower than the current rate in the U.S. But in Moscow, the unemployment rate, uh, rate even now is less than 1 percent. So without labor migrants, basically, uh, Moscow economy and especially service and, uh, sector would just stop. Uh, mm, but for uh, countries like Tajikistan, Moldova, uh, Kyrgyz Republic, Armenia, first of all these, uh, labor migration to Russia and increasingly to some other states, first of all Kazakhstan, uh, is the only social break they essentially have. In case of Moldova that has about four and a half million population, about 500,000 people work abroad. And they, this is basically the major source of income, not only for their families but for the country. Moldova and Kyrgyz Republic, at, uh, Moldova and Tajikistan, I'm sorry, at, at present uh, are among five states with the uh, highest level of, highest share of, uh, uh, well, migrant transfers in the national GDP. It's above 36 percent. Uh, Kyrgyz Republic is also in this group. It has about 27 percent ratio. So these are extremely high. So without these, uh, um, well, financial transfers and without the outflow of labor force, these uh, economies and with them these countries would collapse and basically for Russia it would be uh, as problematic, uh, as uh, uh, much more problematic than bringing these people to Russia. Nevertheless, the uh, Russian government for a long time ignored this problem and uh, in the initial perception was migration is a nuisance and we don't really need to deal with it. Uh, and later it became uh, uh, clear that while well, migration has some positive uh, aspects to it, and thus uh, approximately in 2005, uh, Putin's government at that time uh, has changed its policy, said we want to uh, first encourage immigration, and second, we have uh, to regulate uh, labor migration. But the first uh, point came with a twist. They want to encourage immigration because they realize that it's the only way to uh, solve demographic problems of the country. And what are these problems? Since uh, 1992, uh, Russia has negative uh, natural growth rates. And migration was the only factor that was uh, kind of uh, helping to stabilize the situation, uh, covering uh, during this period, since 1992, uh, well, compensating for 47 percent of the overall uh, losses. This was a very uneven trend. In 2003, it compensated for only 10 percent of losses. Uh, last year it compensated for 51 percent, so it has increased significantly. Uh, but overall, uh, Russian population continues to decline. 
It was 148 million when the Soviet Union fell apart. It is less than one, 142 million now. Uh, pessimistic uh, forecasts give a figure of 80 million people by the end of the century, and then uh, well, uh, optimistic forecast gives a figure of approximately 128 million. Therefore, even the most positive uh, forecasts still say that Russia would continue to, uh, well, die out essentially. Uh, and uh, all this coincides with the internal migration trend uh, resulting in the outflow of population from the east and north towards the center. So every region to the east is losing population to the next to it region to the west, and this trend goes all the, all the way through from the Pacific to Moscow. Uh, at present, less than 25 million people live in the Asian part of uh, uh, the Russian Federation, and uh, this population continues to decline quickly. If you talk about the northernmost uh, areas of uh, Russia, like Chukotka or Kamchatka, they have lost more than 40% of their population, and uh, this decline continues and continues with a pretty uh, fast rate. Thus, Putin accepted the necessity to encourage migration, but again with the twist. Encourage this primarily uh, immigration of Russians and Russian uh, speakers, uh, read essentially, uh, well, uh, Europeans, uh, and uh, the potential for such immigration is very small. On the other hand, those people who are willing to come, mm, primarily people from the Caucasus, Central Asia, and, uh, well, Chinese to some extent, uh, they are not very welcome even under the new policy. Second change concerned the uh, legalization of labor migrants uh, and uh, some progress was achieved. Uh, initially, the figure of uh, legal labor migrants was about 200,000, say, five years ago. Last year, it has reached 1 million. It is a, a very serious change, five-fold increase, but still, uh, compared to the number of, say, um, that I mentioned, 3.5 million, uh, it is less uh, than 30%. Uh, that means that the majority of labor migrants remain in the, uh, well, shadow zone, uh, well, situation that promotes corruption, that promotes violations of their, uh, of, uh, uh, their rights, but also o over has an overall destabilizing effect on, uh, the whole, on the whole country. And, well, because we really have problems with uh, time, uh, let me jump here uh, to this table. I don't know how visible it is. Uh, the uh, increasing share of non-Russians and non-Europeans in the immigration floor, both permanent and uh, labor, results in the uh, quick expansion of xenophobic movements that are basically very frequently supported by the media and ignored by the governmental officials. You can see, uh, well, there are three f uh, columns for each year. First column is the number of people who were killed during such racist uh, incidents. Second, uh, people who were beaten, tortured, uh, mutilated. And the third uh, column is the overall number of uh, such victims. You can see it has increased from 268, including 50 killings, in 2004 to, six, to 619, including 85 killings, in 2007. And then has declined slightly in 2008. So uh, overall, there is a uh, trend towards the increase of uh, these numbers. Uh, well, you can also see that Moscow and St. Petersburg has, uh, have very high shares in the overall number of incidents. I also have to mention here that the decline in the figure uh, in 2008 is related to two major factors. First factor is uh, the reaction, uh, more uh, energetic reaction by the government that started to be, um, well, irritated by the fact that these movements go out of control. Not that it goes against, say, uh, their overall slogans, but it, it is just irritated that they uh, act independently. Second, there is a very unpleasant and dangerous trend in the activities of these groups. Uh, in a sense that they became much more political. They masked their actions uh, uh, if before they claimed 
to be racist, and they were proudly kind of uh, uh, advertising their activities. At present, they, uh, well, engage in masquerade and say, well, if police arrest them, they say, I was not attacking him because he was black, I was attacking him because he has assaulted uh, a girl on a subway and so on. And very frequently, police as well, uh, well, looks, looks the other way. Well, in regard to other groups, you can see the major victims are Central Asians, so Orientals. The Caucasus, well, more or less can be referred to as Hispanics. Middle East and North Africa, East Asia, Chinese, first of all, and uh, uh, other classifications. Uh, dark skin, non-Slavic appears appearance, uh, also attacked by such fascist and racist groups are representatives of youth subcultures, say supporters of rap and so on, uh, and, well, uh, political leftists, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, can you cure this, and can the government cure this? Uh, inherent in the policies of Putin and Medvedev governments in the, uh, recent years, was a deep contradiction. On the other hand, they are trying to deal with the problems, including the problem of uh, uh, both migration and racism, by increasing what they call the vertical of power, basically the incre uh, increasing power of the executive in regard to uh, civic society first, to other branches of government second, and, uh, well, uh, local uh, bodies of uh, government. In specific uh, Russian, uh, well, situation, it means that uh, Putin government, surprisingly, is uh, all the time undermining its own ability to, uh, well, uh, control the situation. Because the weaker civic society is including, say, the media, uh, well, the uh, more opportunities for corruption are uh, for the representatives of police uh, and other uh, bodies of power. Less control from, um, other, well, sectors of government and society. And as, as a result, the government, ironically, the stronger it becomes uh, technically, the weaker it becomes in reality, because uh, any order from the top is uh, basically sabotaged uh, by a cop in the street for whom any new, uh, well, law, any new initiative of government just creates a, another opportunity uh, for extorting a bribe. Uh, say, from, uh, from the uh, uh, undocumented migrant. Uh, and thus, uh, uh, while uh, there are very serious attempts made uh, against after 19, uh, 2005 to regulate uh, the migration issue and to deal with it, essentially uh, the government very frequently uh, loses uh, its ability to uh, improve the situation. And well, I suppose I, I'm running out of time, so I'll stop here. Right. Thank you all. Thank you to Pep and to Blair and to the others who have invited us, uh, to the translators who I think so far, at least from my hearing, have done an excellent job, uh, and to all of you for giving up part of your Friday evening uh, in the rain to come in and hear about places that are, are far from here. And in preparing this, I, I was trying to figure out why someone in, in Barcelona, such a vibrant multicultural place, would be interested in news that's as depressing as I think all of us are, are bringing to you. And I, the, the only value, perhaps, is that it will make you feel very good about what's happening in Barcelona and the, the scope of the problems that you're, that you're facing here. Um, what I'm going to present is, is, in some ways, a very pessimistic uh, picture of, of the condition around migration in South Africa, and one that is very much at odds with the way South Africa likes to represent itself uh, internationally as a country, as the rainbow nation, as a country of immense um, diversity committed to human rights uh, and to multiculturalism. Obviously, I'll only be able to speak very superficially about the country in the, in the short time that we have, the same problem that all of us will face. I do have copies of a report that we've done and some other work for those of you who want to really ruin your, the rest of your weekend uh, can spend your time reading that. All right. Let me begin um, by refreshing your memory of something that images I'm sure that you saw on television last year uh, in May 2008 of some ext of an extraordinary level of violence that occurred during which very famous pictures were taken of, of a Mozambican man 
being burned alive, um, and there's two of them here, by people in one of the townships just outside of, of Johannesburg, actually part of Johannesburg, just about four kilometers away from the stock exchange uh, and some of the most expensive property in, the, in, on, in sub-Saharan Africa. There's a township, Alexandra, where this violence started and quickly spread across the country, killing 63 people, displacing more than 100,000 people within two weeks. This is part of a long history, unfortunately, of, of xenophobia uh, in South Africa that is something that is shared, all of the public opinion polls suggest, is shared across the socioeconomic and racial spectrum. In fact, wealthy whites seem to be the, those who hate foreigners or dislike foreigners most, but uh, it's, don't have much to do with them. It's the, the poor, largely black population who lives with the foreign population that seems to be really expressing uh, this dislike. Some people in South Africa have called this racism, something I don't understand. I think it, it is linked very much to an idea of, of nationalism and about who South Africans are and certainly some confusion about who South Africans are. Uh, the violence that happened is, while it came as a surprise to a lot of people in government and elsewhere, if you look below the surface, this is something that has been going on since 1994, during the time of Mandela and afterwards, in which migrants have suffered from everything from being denied access to social services to being pushed off of, of trains and attacked uh, and robbed. And, and targeted by the police who, of course, see their vulnerability as an opportunity uh, for enrichment. And I think this has generated is something that, that a lot of liberal countries now are facing in how to deal with, uh, stay committed to their liberal principles of equality and tolerance at one level and deal with a very unpopular group who is seen as threatening uh, the welfare of, of, um, of the host population and also how to deal with the a host population who's unwilling to respect the laws of their own country in dealing with migration. Uh, and as we've seen, by going outside of the law, uh, by saying the state is not doing enough to protect us as such, we must uh, protect ourselves. I think there's a lot at stake here. Um, and we, you know, in looking at social capital and even some forms of just straight capital, I think that migration is critical not just to South Africa, which has a huge skills gap uh, because of the apartheid education system and because of brain drain, but also critical to the whole region. Uh, half of the working age population from Lesotho, a country completely surrounded by South Africa, lives in South Africa and is basically the only income for that country. Over the last five years, it is basically money from South Africa that has kept Zimbabwe from completely collapsing for better or worse. Uh, and from Mozambique and other countries, it is, it's absolutely central. Uh, the ability to find work for people in South Africa is critical to the whole region's development and, and its stability. Uh, it is also critical to South Africa meeting its own domestic uh, objectives in terms of finding teachers, engineers, others who often coming from a better educated environments nearby, but who can't find work in Zimbabwe or Mozambique or Congo, Somalia, else Kenya, who are now coming to South Africa. And that's, uh, it's been shown over and over again that this is the only way South Africa is going to meet its development targets and, and fill the important jobs in the civil service uh, and in private sector. Uh, so migration and making sure those people are productive and, and integrated is critical to South Africa. I think that it's also critical the way in which South Africa treats the rest of the, the continent's residents who are in the country is central to South Africa's ability to represent Africa on an international spectrum. And I think South Africa has a special place globally as a kind of moral leader uh, within Africa and someone who can stand up uh, to the G20 or to others and say, look, this is what Africa needs. And I think that that, that reputation has been deeply damaged by the way in which uh, foreigners have been, have been treated. I think this is also quite an interesting case because we often don't look at, at third world countries or developing countries as countries uh, as a destination. Uh, and I think that there's, there's some interesting dynamics that are quite different from Europe but others that are quite similar. It also speaks about a kind of post-authoritarian environment and what it means uh, to try to go through a, a double conversion at one time. But I think Spain started becoming wealthy and then and freer and then getting immigrants, whereas South Africa integrated into the world 
and started getting immigrants almost immediately. And I think there's been a lot of confusion over what that means, what it means to be South African. The arguments that I'm going to try to make, and you'll, because of the short time, you'll just have to take my word for most of these things because I won't be able to show you much evidence to support them. Um, but the first is that, that social and cultural capital in an environment um, like South Africa, in which there's not some shared set of values or shared set of institutions or an effective legal system in many instances, when social and cultural capital emerge, it can often be deeply destructive. Uh, because any kind of social capital or emergence of a society is usually a bounded society. And that means there's an insider and an outsider. And as South Africa tries to figure out who, it's, uh, who it is, what it means to be South African, they're doing that in, in some ways uh, very much uh, against a foreign other. Uh, and the kind of political capital similarly is not always centered in, in political institutions, but rather people trying to mobilize support uh, at a very localized level, um, making claims based on a shared ethnic or spatial history, uh, which is often a very negative uh, and one that is very uh, violent. And the way in which I see this happening is, is a sort of DNA like double helix or triple helix in which South African identity is emerging very much in line with the kind of migrant identity. By having migrant as a common nation, but in opposition to responded in many instances with a very negative attitude towards South Africans and a kind of self-alienation, and as I'll show later, increasingly a kind of ghettoization in which they have decided it's impossible to live with South Africans who are intolerant and violent, and they're emerging, uh, trying to form their own uh, ways of protecting um, themselves. This is something that is now very difficult for the South African government to deal with, partially because they have relied in the past on a very strong, on one side, a pro-pan-Africanist agenda, but also a very anti-immigrant agenda, blaming foreigners for a lot of the problems that they faced. And it's now very difficult for them to say, actually, we need these people. Uh, after 20 years of blaming them for not for, for stealing jobs and for uh, undermining security, you can't now say we need to protect them. I do, however, think that there are some opportunities for building social cohesion, and I'll try to talk about those um, at the end, but by building very much at the local level in environments where we've started to see enormous South African heterogeneity, meaning that those groups are themselves so fragmented that they can't organize against foreigners. And I think that the leadership in those communities can actually be called on to try to build a, a kind of nationalism that is more of a bricolage uh, and a bit more postmodern than the kind of very territorially bounded uh, nationalism that we're seeing elsewhere. So let me first, I think to understand the South African environment, we need to look a bit more, not just at the recent response to foreigners, but a bit at the way in which the South African state has generated a very fragmented uh, South African population. And I think this is something, for those of you who know anything about South Africa, it was built on a system of divide and rule and where ethnic identity became your primary marker and it also allowed you, it was also connected to what you were allowed to do, who you were allowed to, to interact with, and particularly where uh, you were allowed to live. So there was no sort of central body that represented everyone even the political system was very uh, fragmented. And this helped generate a, a very deep suspicion of outsiders. You got a, an idea of space in which particular people belong to a very particular space. This was a Zulu area, this was a Kosa area, a Tswana area, a white area, or an Indian area. And anyone who was coming from outside was somehow seen as polluting that uh, the, and, and eroding your control of that uh, particular space. Of course, it also generated enormous suspicion, justifiably, against most central state institutions, which were seen as repressive uh, and, and uh, sort of generally unfriendly. Another important thing that emerged in South Africa during this period was a lot of violence against the state, uh, trying to overturn the state and, and the apartheid system, but a lot of gangsterism and other forms of violence that took, that labeled itself as political when in fact it was just deeply criminal. And so you have 
violence becoming a more or less legitimate way of form of political expression and a, a, a kind of very blurry line between what was political and what was just uh, criminal. I think in the post-apartheid environment, a lot of this has now been turned on controlling the central cities. This was an area where the black population was not allowed and was sort of seen as a primary resource. It's where most of the wealth uh, was held. And now you're starting to see the black population moving in and trying to claim those areas as theirs. You know, in the past, this was because of the spatial fragmentation. This was an area that was off limits. Now, what's critical to our, to the black population's kind of self-realization is being able to control the cities. And of course, that is where they end up meeting a lot of the migrants. These are some of the areas, just as a way of illustration, where the violence took place. These are in the cities or in the townships just outside of the city centers. They're not, it's hard to imagine these as, as kind of wealthy areas that you'd want particularly to control. But these are the, the sort of gateways into the cities. Uh, and this is, these are, are, tend to be quite poor areas right outside of very wealthy areas. I think the reason, I mean, I'll, I'll now turn to why I think outsiders have such a, get such trouble. The first is what I've said before, that there's this long history of coding outsiders as threats. The South African government during apartheid coded the rest of the continent as a sort of basket case, and that was part of the justification for white rule, because if you look at you, the rest of the continent, this is what happens when you let blacks from the rest of the world rule themselves. So this is why whites have to come in. And there's still, oddly, even among the downtrodden black population, a sense of superiority vis-a-vis -vis people who come from outside. Uh, there's also a sense that if you're from outside, you're coming to take something that belongs uh, to us, which was part of the justification for keeping blacks out of the white cities. You have seen this even in the post-apartheid era. And here's some quotations. These are from people who fought apartheid tooth and nail as, and fought presumably in the name of justice and, and universal rights, who are now saying, you know, coding migrants in very broad strokes as criminals, as threatening uh, South Africa's ability to achieve its, its objectives. Those same sorts of ideas have now translated into a language on the street in which foreigners are seen as an inherent threat to South African prosperity, to the black population's ability to control the cities and to control uh, the wealth. I mean, this last quotation I find is, is very powerful in that saying, look, we are not trying to kill anyone, but rather solving the problems of our own country. Basically, you cannot become wealthy, we cannot uh, end poverty as long as there are foreigners here. And this is a, an idea that I think is, is widely held, of course, is, is based on, you could say, a kind of false consciousness or a misreading of this situation, but that's very much the idea that's there. There's a sense of competition for everything, as I said, from jobs, particularly houses, publicly provided houses, and one of the things we heard over and over again during the violence, over women. And there's a lot there to look at in terms of sort of masculinity and threatened masculinities, but very much this idea that foreigners are coming in and stealing South African women, which are one of the country's greatest uh, resources. There's also now a political leadership change which fed into this, uh, which is with, with Zuma, who is likely to be with Jacob Zuma, who will be elected next week, a very populist kind of leader who's coming in with uh, uh, trying to counter the elitism of Tabo and Becky, and particularly his elitism that was seen as pan-African, right? And so the new leadership is now seen as putting South Africa first, uh, and that that is very much part of what's behind these these um, movements. There's also been, as I mentioned before, a long history of, of violence and a long history of impunity in which people have gotten away with it. So just looking quickly at, at where violence is most likely, and I think this is where we see the issue of social capital coming very clearly in our, our study across the country, where the violence happened was in those areas where you have a highly transient foreign population and South African communities. These are er South African communities that have recently urbanized, who are often very young, very male, often um, and who often don't stay in the same place for very long. So it's not a community in itself mo that is already existing, but rather a community that is mobilizing against uh, foreign foreigners. We also tended to see an it's an area which doesn't is a heterogeneous community, but where control over 
local government is more or less up for grabs. And what you're starting to see then is the effort to control local government is linked to mobilizing against foreigners. Perfect. One, because it's a convenient scapegoat for your failings, but also because foreigners have resources that you can then take. And this is something that happened over and over again. The foreigners were attacked, their houses were then taken and distributed to political supporters. So that the, the foreigners become a, a political resource that then in itself feeds uh, the violence. Again, where we're seeing the violence happening is in places where they do not trust the central institutions. So they don't rely on the state to solve their problems. It's very much an idea that they must solve them themselves. And they often do that through violence. So basically, in the areas that we saw the attacks, it was not necessarily the poorest communities, but rather um, they're all poor, but the, the ones which were closest to wealthy areas and so there's some sort of idea of relative deprivation, of being denied something which has generated uh, this, this anger. As I said before, it's an area where there's not effective political monopolies or political legitimacy. It's in areas where you have a fragmented local political environment, and so there's real competition uh, for local resources. We have also seen that there seems to be some sort of history of violence, where there was violence in the past, whether it was anti-apartheid violence or other forms of violent protest, because of the history of impunity and the legitimacy surrounding violence in the past, this is an area where we've also seen a resurgence uh, of violence. Um, so basically, the, 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 we're seeing that community leadership makes a difference, which is a positive thing in the sense that that provides an avenue for change, but it also has a lot to do with the particular composition and the history of those communities which of course are things that we cannot uh, change so easily. So just as a way of, of ending, uh, which is so, uh, something I hinted at when I started, I think that this violence and the violence that's happened over the last few years is generating three ways of, of kind of being and different forms of understanding of citizenship, if you want to use that term, in South Africa. The first is a kind of thin cosmopolitan nationalism, and, and you can see this protest, which looks very big, which was a protest against um, xenophobia. But if you compare this to the pictures we saw from Los Angeles yesterday, this was a couple thousand people who showed up in a city of eight million. Uh, you know, and this is a very much, these were old anti-apartheid activists. The, the real left, the popular left from the townships was, was nowhere to be found. So you have this among a certain elite, a kind of commitment to cosmopolitanism, a recognition that South Africa's image was deeply bruised internationally by the violence and by the treatment of foreigners, but that is not a view that's held uh, on the street or among the poor. I think among the poor, what you're starting to see is very much a kind of territorialized ethno-nationalism. For some, it's couched very much in terms of nationalism that we need to protect South Africa from the rest of the continent. There's been calls for military, increased military patrols on the border, uh, kind of U.S. style fence, um, all of these sorts of things. But for others, it's even uh, subnational, with an idea based on the apartheid history that certain ethnic groups need to be able to control the cities. And indeed, during the violence that happened in May, a third of the people who were killed were South Africans who were from particular minority groups. Right? So that there is, and I think this is by far the most dominant view that has emerged. Uh, and then, as I said, among the, the foreigners, you're seeing a kind of self-alienation. A sense, look, we tried to come, we tried to live peacefully with you, we, we've hired you, some of us have even married you, but this is the kind of thanks that we get. And you're starting to see people moving out of the townships and into the city center where they live together in kind of migrant ghettos because of the, the need for physical self-protection. Uh, and I think that that's, in the long term, will only generate uh, further resentment against them. So my last slide, where to from here? I don't have any great ideas. Unlike the panel yesterday, I'm not a politician. I'm not an activist, truly. So you know, I'll just suggest some thoughts and, and certainly welcome others who have experience elsewhere. I mean, I think that the first thing we really need to see is to try to remove the profitability, profitability of violence. Uh, and some of this is very simple, of trying to counter impunity uh, people who got away, there's been very little investigation into the violence that's happened at all. Often the police are part of the violence. 
have helped support it. Uh, so they're the last ones who want to investigate it. Um, I think we, we need to, you know, obviously the leaders who are behind it, we need to go after them. And I think we do need to find new ways of, of resolving conflicts within official structures. Uh, part of the, the problems that we've seen in South Africa is that people need to take these uh, mechanisms on uh, to their, uh, they take them on rather than going and using the political leadership, they develop it, uh, they, they develop mechanisms uh, to mobilize at the local level. But I think more broadly, we need to have the kind of discussions that we're having here in South Africa. South African politicians have been very scared, I think, post-apartheid, to really have an open discussion of what it means to be South African, how different ethnic groups, different racial groups, different nationality groups actually relate to each other. They've sort of said, look, we're the rainbow nation, and just left it at that. Uh, and I think there does need to be a very open discussion led by uh, what's left of the legi legitimate national leadership uh, to try to discuss that and to discuss what it means to be, you know, to build a nation in an era of globalization, regional integration, uh, and things like that. And lastly, to try to support those leaders in communities that resisted the violence. As I mentioned before, there were some where there were highly fragmented, heterogeneous South African communities who were so worried that some of their own might be attacked that they stood up against the violence. And I think those are, that's definitely, uh, there's some lessons that we can learn uh, from there. As the last, you know, and so I don't actually end be being optimistic. Let me end on a, a final note of pessimism. Uh, it's just that in the, in the political environment that's taking shape in South Africa now, which is one of deep populism coupled with declining GDP per capita uh, because of the global economic crisis, I think that it's, it's less likely that we're going to have this kind of national discussion about how to integrate migrants, we're more likely to see uh, foreigners being increasingly used as scapegoats uh, for and 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 um, disenfranchised and having their their stuff taken away from them uh, in the name of, of providing assistance to South Africans. So let me just end there. Uh, we're happy to describe anything in more detail in the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, next, we'll turn a little bit closer to Barcelona, um, to Paris, and we'll hear from... Uh thank you. Let me first uh, thank uh, Pep Subiros and his friends for uh, inviting me and and ask you also to forgive my clumsy English and and uh, so clumsy that I will have to read my paper instead of talking um, So we're talking about the assimilation or exclusion of migrating populations in France uh, Being being located at the very western edge of the Eurasian continent and completely open on its eastern side France as we know it today has for centuries and probably for millennia absorbed a flux of immigrants. Following the setting sun and maybe looking for better pastures or richer crops, people have flocked from far away to this kind of swallow hole that is now called France. The basic frame of the question raised by the migration fact is a permanently mingling population. Unlike Spain, England, or Germany, France cannot claim a stable relationship between its territory and its population. Reading Brodel confirms the idea that at least for the past two millennia, successive layers of population coming from different parts of the Eurasian landmass have adopted, along with the ter territory, France's cultural habits and specific languages. We should stress out that they, are, they have adopted such customs and la languages in the way they could. Thus the old age question of how to deal with newcomers and how to consider them. On this issue, the best and the worst of attitudes and policies have been in an unending competition. France has produced the worst types of racism and the brightest open-mindedness, setting aside brutal rejection, which is probably the case now. Basically, two types of policy have been implemented to, for adopting newcomers. One is assimilation, the other is called integration. Assimilation first considers anybody coming within the borders of these, these 
lands and country at the very edge of the continent should adopt its habits and willy-nilly become French. The concept of assimilation is based on a metaphor of digestion. Anybody willing to become a citizen has first to adopt all those cultural traits involved in being French. That means not only language, but also <coughs> religion, food, historical fantasies, and the like. The metaphor is based on the belief that a stable French model can be duplicated and cloned indefinitely. On this pattern, for instance, immigrant Jews in the 30s were invited to change their family names and sometimes to embrace other religious beliefs. Integration offers more consideration to the newcomers. The concept comes from mathematics and suggests that the whole being the sum of, the, of its parts. Parts can be integrated into whole. It therefore admits that the cultures of immigrants do not disappear in the transformation process, but that they are part of the very dynamics of, of that process. However astute and sometimes efficient such policies may have been, neither now fit the time. Both assimilation and integration belong to a political logic induced by the domination of, nation, of the issue by nation states. This domination no longer exists. For the past half century, the nation state has been progressively supplanted by various geo geopolitical forces that have disqualified it for the main role in cultural processes. As an insight into this issue, let me mention only two such forces that determine the cultural process, the cultural process. One, um, one is the building up of huge diasporas all over the world. Gujaratis in Dubai, Turkmens in Russia, Pakistanis in Br Britain, Malians in France, Turks in Germany, Mexicans in the US, all these massive population movements disrupt the relation between culture and territory. They invite people to admit that they no longer belong to a single cultural envi environment, but to two of them or to several of them. And that adopting different cultural patterns, depending on circum cir circumstances and situations, creates new patterns which are totally disterritorialized. They no longer closely refer to any geographical territory. Another example can be found in the power of the, of the NGOs in some poor countries of Asia, Asia or Africa. We therefore have to adopt different ways of dealing with the migration factor, different way of thinking of the relationship between cultures and the various sides of the process. In order to answer, answer the question raised by this symposium and to envisage the present time transformation, I suggest we adopt the very simple idea of cross-consideration. The hypothesis I base my suggestion on is also very intellectually very simple. It is grounded on the work of anthropologists like Franz Boas in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century and Levi-Strauss in the second part of the 20th century. It reckons that all culture are of are of equal value in terms of worth and potential. This principle of equality allied with, to the globalization factor that dislocates cultures leads us to a critical view of prison politics through the prism of cross-consideration. The actors involved in such cross-consideration are many. On the one side, we find the perpetrators of mainstream culture. I mean, what we call in France, Francais de Souche, which means French born and bred or French of all stock. In the British eyes, this reality inheres in an enduring Englishness or Welshness um, that no immigrant will ever achieve. But we know that in France, England, or even in Switzerland, the cultural makeup of this so-called all stock is extremely composite. It includes subcultures, fierce opposition between groups, and continuous movement. On the other side, 
the vari variation is, of course, even wider. It includes all the assorted cultural groups and communities that are involved in the globalization process. I mean, Jews who consider Israel as a potential refuge, Sicilians who have family in New York, Moroccans working in Andalusian greenhouses, etc. And within the same country, all the various groups or subgroups who in most developing countries, and in France especially, contribute to, a f to fashioning a patchwork of what is called cultures and sometimes ethnies. In a more political language, uh, language, I would call the patchwork of migrating people popular culture. And the long time established cultures, dominant culture or mainstream culture. So facing each other off, these two entities, which cannot be considered as totally distinct, need to appraise the mutual consideration they ex expect of each other and indeed sometimes receive, but not often. And it is such an appraisal I, I propose undertaking here and now. Um, since my time is short, I will not develop all the themes I, I'm, I'm, I've written, but I will leave you this, um, this paper for reading for you again. But I will um, stress on two, um, two aspects of this cross-consideration. Um, on one aspect the, is the recognition of the cultural traits of ordinary immigrants by the host country. Um, Arjun Hapadurai notes that if culture can hardly be defined as a substantive, it is especially meaningful as an adjective, cultural. Um, here it's Hapadurai speaking. If culture as, as a noun seems to carry association with some sort of substance in a way that appears to conceal more than it reveals, cultural, the adjective, moves one into a realm of differences, contrast, comparisons that is more helpful. Those differences, comparisons, and contrast emphasize the contribution of a range of involved groups, among whom are the communities or sub-communities that now make up the patchwork of all Western societies and specifically, specifically France. When talking about contribution, you accept that each single piece of the mosaic is, equally with the others, a contributor to the general design. One piece missing, and the whole mosaic is disqualified. The contribution of each different community is not expected only from its narrow specificity. It is expected on all issues and all dynamics. West Africans in France are not only good footballers. Gypsies are not only good musicians. Homosexuals are not only gifted artists. This is why it is so important to widen the scope of recognition to all cultural features and on this basis assess the real determination of a nation to move into the process of cross-consideration. And I will develop the case of language on this, this aspect. French as the official language of France has been institutionalized and almost judicialized as far back as uh, 1539. From that time on, that means from the 16th century, all regional, regional languages have been considered mere dialects improper to normal speech, text, or conversation. Slang or popular language had to wait for Céline in the mid-20th century to be considered a suitable language for literature. Today, if the European Union protects regional languages, literary institutions like editors, university, TV, or politicians are far from giving, giving recognition to modern slang called Verlan. But this recognition has been established in and by popular discourse. As a matter of fact, Verlan the contemporary slang spoken in the lower class suburbs of France is probably, probably by far one of the more dy dynamic segments of the French language. A spoken language rather than a written one, Verlan develops a sense of metaphor and vividness unknown in French speech since Rabelais and only matched by French as spoken by in the Caribbean and in Africa. 
taking an opposite perspective than academic French, Verlon is a secret, flexible, unstable, blurred way of talking. It borrows from Arabic, from African languages, from English, from all regional slangs. It invents or reinvents words and expression every day and every minute. It is different from region to region, from, from neighborhood to neighborhood, and from staircase to staircase. Only very recently has it been printed by renowned publishers, but the lucky authors, lucky authors of Verne written novels are still basically considered by French intelligentsia as cheap, literary flash in the pan, flirt, flirting with the riffraff. The second aspect of, um, of this course consideration is the recognition of mainstream cultures by the ordinary, by, by the immigrating population. Two aspects seem to be at issue in this matter. The first is the ability of migrant family and individuals to understand the codes and mythology, to decipher the symbols and to play the games prevailing in the host country. The second is what it is generally thought should be the willingness of these same people to embrace such codes, symbols, myth and the like. On further reflection, however, it seems clear in this respect that, with the notable exception of the very political fringe of the immigrant groups, willingness and capacity are very closely linked. Whoever is capable of embracing the dominant cultural traits of the country he or she lives in wants to enjoy the relief of belonging here and now. Thus, the big issue is that of access. Can immigrant groups access mainstream culture? Is their access easy, fr free, pleasurable? Or is it hindered, expensive and painful? Are there many helpers, mediators, translators? Or is everyone obliged to rely on his or her own resources to adopt and recognize the defining traits of mainstream culture? In assessing the French case, we shall focus on four cultural traits, sets, that are still on my paper and I won't, won't read uh, this evening, um, which are thought to be among the basic pathways to embracing French values and behaviors. I will only stress the case of, of um, school. In the French Republican tradition, as instituted by the, what we call the Third Republic, that ran from the Commune of Paris in 1871 to World War II, state schools were, with, with con compulsory military service, the mainstay in the process of integrating outsiders. At that time, such outsiders included Bretons, Auvergne, Alsatians, Provencals, and later Polish, East European Jews, and Italians. Some people openly asser asserted, even among the left, that Italians, for instance, and that was in the, in the 20s and 30s, were so different from the French that they were totally unassimilable. But the country was in such a desperate need of a workforce that the school were assigned the role of turning all those near barbarians into real French. It may have uh, half worked for a couple of decades. It doesn't work anymore. Today, access to primary school for immigrant children is easy. The main reason is probably that combination of childhood and the goodwill of school teacher makes for flexible learning and reading, counting and speaking, thus providing smooth access. But two major obstacles hinder the way to better understanding and easy recognition. The first is that school is not only assigned the role of teaching knowledge and skills, but also of inculcating the rules of decent behavior. Above all, schools in the French suburbs is expected to socialize children whose parents or grandparents coming from elsewhere behave differently. Moreover, the same school is supposed to take over the role of, of so-called dysfunctioning families and teach the logic of rule, right, authority, and infringement. 
So instead of in inculcating val social values indirectly, school too often assumes the negative duties of the law enforcer. This role, accepted with conflicting, feel conflicting feelings by most teachers, turns school into the bad guy in the chi children ma mindset. Um, let me propose you my conclusion. Um, and as conclusion, to uh, suggest that uh, the concept of re res respect, respect um, is a social skill which is offered not only to migrant people, but to all, all French people. The housing estate of France, like those of most European countries, are places of great cultural variety and intense cultural activity. Patchwork or mosaics are words commonly used to describe neighborhoods where 20 to 50 languages are often spoken. Thus, coming from a distant place, one doesn't really know who is who and who values what. Who are the real French, for instance? What can be, what can, can be done or said when we, we meet at the school gate, in the supermarket, and in the stairwell? What is the real power of a uniform person wandering in the street, driving a bus, or delivering mail? When all is said and done, what type of attitude can I expect from the people who seem to belong here? All those questions and many others entail the ex expectation of respect. Respect is the basic value expected in welfare housing. This respect is not the stiff attitude of the poor bending down to the rich, the young bending down to the old, or the fool bending down to the wise. It is a horizontal feeling involving the acknowledgement of intrinsic credit and distance between everyone in a given space. Credit is based on the underlying belief that I, coming from a distant land, and not really understanding the codes here, I deserve the minimum esteem that later will be seen to have been justified and maintained. Distance is the subsequent demand. In the meantime, and since we do, do not know each other so well, let us keep a respectful distance. Let us not deepen our relations too hastily. Both attitudes of credit and distance are skills needed not only by those living in government housing, but in this time of globalization by everyone. Lastly, the French of all stock should be willing to recognize that immigrants have acquired specific skills and capacities developed and refined in the very process of migration. Respect in the sense defined by contemporary history is the quality that help foster cohabitation among the multifarious cultures, each more widely spread in a globalized world. Thank you.